Let's pull up the dictionary again. Where did it go? Okay, so uh, as we saw last time, we're exploring this correspondence between uh, concepts uh, from classical computer science and quantum many body physics. So CSPs, constraint satisfaction problems, correspond to Hamiltonians. Variables of the CSP correspond to qubits. Constraints are Hamiltonian terms. Uh, you know, we have like, uh, say, an optimal solution is a ground state of your Hamiltonian. And how you measure the solution quantity, uh, sorry, solution quality, this is measured by the energy of a state with respect to your Hamiltonian. Okay. Um, and then the corresponding complexity theory has also a nice mapping, like P and NP map over to BQP and QMA, which we'll talk about in depth today. Um, and last time we talked about the Cook-Levin theorem. So there's a Cook-Levin sat formula, and this corresponds to a construction known as the feynman of hamiltonian okay, which we hopefully will get to today. All right, so uh, this is the dictionary. Let's uh, keep this in mind. Um, Last time we saw uh, a definition of what local Hamiltonians are, right? So we talked about K local Hamiltonians. Um, there's, this notion comes from physics. Uh, it's a way to describe physical systems um, and, and the, you know, the local interactions between particles in these systems. Um, but you know, the way we wanna view it uh, in this class is as a quantum analog of a constraint satisfaction problem. So it's a Hamiltonian acting on n qubits is a two to the n by two to the n Hermitian matrix that is a sum of local terms, right? Uh, where these local terms are the constraints on our qubits. Um, and last time we saw, you know, why it's the generalization of constraint satisfaction problems. Uh, for example, uh, we can write the max cut problem, which is a classical optimization or classical constraint satisfaction problem as a, a Hamiltonian, right? So the classical max cut, you know, if you have a graph, then the, the corresponding Hamiltonian would be, you know, for every edge in the graph, you have this Hamiltonian term, which is the poly Z matrices acting on qubits U and V. Um, and the ground states of this Hamiltonian will be, you know, uh, the, the ground space is spanned by optimal solutions to the max cut problem, right? Um, and in the lecture notes from last week, you can take a look. Uh, there's a derivation uh, uh, explaining why the ground states uh, of this Hamiltonian are the, these classical strings that tell you how to obtain a max cut in, in this particular graph. Um, but the max cut problem uh, is a classical problem, right? So um, what are some other examples of local Hamiltonians that are more genuinely quantum, that exhibit true quantum behavior? So uh, I'll just uh, write down um, a very uh, well-studied and well-known family of Hamiltonians uh, known as the, uh, the Heisenberg model. So this is actually a, uh, not a single Hamiltonian, but it's a family of Hamiltonians that's parameterized by um, some parameters. So it's a Hamiltonian that's a function of uh, four real numbers. I'll call it Jx, Jy, Jz, and G. These are all real numbers. These are real parameters. And you know, this is some Hamiltonian that acts on n qubits. We can think of these qubits as, say, living on a line or in a grid or some lattice or maybe some more general graph. Uh, for now, we'll just think of it as 
um, uh, you know, the qubits are arranged in a line. So uh, the Hamiltonian terms are grouped into uh, different buckets. We have one bucket that corresponds to the, uh, the poly x terms. So on qubits i and uh, its neighbor i plus one, we have these, uh, this term xi tensor xi plus one. We also have a similar thing with the poly y matrices. The z matrices. And we also have this uh, term that runs, uh, we have single qubit x terms. So for every combination of real numbers, jx, jy, jz, and g, we have a different Hamiltonian. And each of these Hamiltonians has a ground energy, has a ground state, has a whole spectrum, right? Uh, and the properties of these ground states uh, can vary uh, wildly depending on uh, what parameters you choose for these j's and, and g, right? So for example, uh, you know, this actually recovers the original max cut. Like if you set, you know, j z equals to one, g equals to zero, and j x equals j y equals to zero, this is just the, the max cut, the classical max cut problem. Um, an interesting choice of parameters, though, are when you set j, x, j, y, j, z all to be the same. Let's say we set them to one, and maybe we'll just set uh, g equals to zero. And this is known, sometimes this is called the quantum max cut problem. And this is a very interesting model um, because the ground states uh, are, um, in, they're, uh, in general, very quantum, like they're highly entangled. They, they have lots of uh, quantum entanglement going on. And, uh, and one way to see why this is kind of like a genuinely quantum, describes like a quantum system, well, if you look at these terms, they don't necessarily commute with each other, right? Because, you know, so J, all of these J's are equal to one. So you have the, these, uh, e, you know, this balance of X, Y, and Z terms. Um, and each of these constraints are, are kind of asking the qubits to do something, you know, different in different bases. And the ground state is trying to satisfy all of these Hamiltonian terms as best as possible. Uh, in fact, so, you know, let's sort of zoom in on uh, just a specific i. So we have, uh, let's say, the i-th qubit and the i plus first qubit. And on these two qubits, um, we have xi and xi plus one asking these two qubits uh, to be in a certain state. Um, you know, similarly for yi and, and, uh, and zi and zi plus one. Uh, does anyone know what the ground state, uh, let's say, you know, we just have this Hamiltonian on two qubits. Uh, does anyone know what the ground state of this Hamiltonian would be? Any guesses? So this is a, a two qubit Hamiltonian. Would it not be something like spread equally among all the eigenstates you now like of each of those operators? <clears throat> well, um, uh, let's see. So, so this, uh, if you sum all these terms up, uh, it will have a unique ground state. Um, this, it, it will be true that the ground state of this, the sum of these things will be, I think, uh, yeah, will be the ground state of each of these individually. This is not always true, by the way. Um, but in this particular case, uh, you do have this property. So, 
Um, so this shouldn't, this is not too hard to calculate. Like you can run it through MATLAB or something, or you know, you know, take five minutes to write it out. But uh, if you do the computation and you diagonalize this uh, four by four matrix, uh, you'll get that the, the ground state of this matrix will be an entangled state. It's uh, this thing called the singlet. So this looks kind of like the um, maximally entangled, uh, like, like an EPR pair that we've seen before, um, except you know, the two bits are flipped. Um, they're, you know, anti-aligned and there's like a minus sign between, but it's basically the same as a, uh, as a maximally entangled state. <clears throat> um, and it's kind of interesting because between every consecutive pair of qubits, I and I plus one, uh, in order to like try to satisfy each of these terms, these two qubits really want to be in this maximally entangled state. But actually as, uh, you know, you're, you're working on in the problem set, it's not possible for, let's say, uh, one qubit to be maximally entangled with its right neighbor and also maximally entangled with its left neighbor. So what happens is when you sum up many of these terms together in this uh, quantum max cut Hamiltonian, you have a bunch of constraints that are not all simultaneously satisfiable because you're asking the qubits to do things that are, are not possible. Uh, so, so what happens is uh, the, the ground state just tries to, um, you know, satisfy some of them and sacrifice satisfying the other ones. Uh, and, and there's like lots of really interesting structure that, that comes up. So, um, and I actually, uh, you know, I'm not an expert in this area, but as far as I can tell, I don't know if there's any uh, exact description of uh, what the ground state of of this model is. Um, I mean, people sort of study this model to death and they have like lots of uh, really good understanding, but um, I don't know if anyone can sort of write down like a closed form expression of uh, what the ground state is. But I mean, if, if you know about this, uh, um, I'd be happy to, to hear about uh, it. I don't know. I don't know for sure, but it might be the case that for one dimension, you can solve it exactly. But uh, mm -hmm. as soon as you get into two dimensions, then you get some frustration and then you cannot solve it exactly. I know this is the case for the Hubbard model. Um, mm -hmm. In one dimension, you have an analytic formula for it. Uh, but as soon as you increase the dimensionality, it's hard to solve. Right. Right. Although I think even uh, in this, in, for this specific model in, in one dimension, it's like if all the qubits are in, like, in a ring, we, it's still frustrated. Like you cannot you know, from this monogamy entanglement, you cannot satisfy all of the, the constraints uh, simultaneously. Oh, I see. Adrian seems to have a link to uh, a solution. Um, but yes, you know, this analyzing these sort of Hamiltonians is like the bread and butter of, of lots of uh, um, what people do in physics from what I understand. And there's like a huge literature around it. Uh, and uh, there's lots of interesting things going on. Um, so in this class, we're not going to focus on solving any particular uh, Hamiltonian. I mean, that's something for like a condensed matter uh, theory course. Um, but instead, we're going to take a step back and think about this problem of solving local Hamiltonians uh, more abstractly, like just solving Hamiltonians in, in the abstract. Right, so I want to phrase this as a, uh, a computational problem, like a problem that you would want to solve on a computer, and not just pen and paper. Um, so uh, I'm going to define the k local Hamiltonian problem. I'll just abbreviate as k local ham. I'll uh, give two subscripts a and b. These are uh, numbers. So k, a, and b are numbers. So this is going to be a decision problem. Okay, um, and uh, A and B are real numbers. K is an integer that represents the locality, like how many qubits each of your Hamiltonian terms act on. And the instances of this uh, problem 
like you know the input to your to the computer when you're trying to have the computer solve it uh, is going to be some k local Hamiltonian acting on n qubits. Okay, so uh, each of these uh, are k local terms. Okay, so like the description to the, the computer would be how many qubits are you acting on? N. How many terms are there? M. Uh, and then for each term, you're going to say which subset of k qubits the term H is going to act on. And then you have to specify what the, the term is. So uh, since it acts on k qubits, you just need to specify a k qubit operator. So a two to the k by two to the k matrix. And then once you've written down all this data, this tells you everything you need to know. Well, it tells you what the Hamiltonian is. So th these are what the instances are. Uh, and then what is the decision problem? You have to have a yes and no instance. So the yes instance is when the Sorry, ground. Henry? Yeah. Uh, I didn't get, I didn't quite get what the A and B parameters were and why A is smaller than B. Oh, I'm going to uh, say what it is right now. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, no, yeah, no, perfect. So, so the yes instance is to say that the, um, the ground energy of this local Hamiltonian, the minimum eigenvalue is less than this number A. And the no instance is uh, when this minimum energy is, is greater than B, or at least B. I don't know if you, I don't know, is that off screen or something? Uh, maybe, let me do this. So you present this local Hamiltonian to the computer and you're asking the computer, tell me, is it a yes instance or is it a no instance? Is the ground energy less than A or, or, or uh, at least B? And your, the computer has to do something to, uh, to try to figure this out. If your Hamiltonian doesn't uh, satisfy either one of it, maybe the minimum energy is somewhere in between A and B, we don't care. Like we just, it, that's sort of like not part of the discussion. You promise that the input to the problem satisfies, uh, it's either a yes instance or a no instance. So th that's what this decision problem is. This is what this K local ham AB, you have to do, so, so figure out the minimum energy. And you can yeah. Oh, like, so we don't care about the values of A and B. We just pick two, uh, a, two values A and B and we uh, propose this, Okay, if it's smaller than A, it satisfies the instance, uh, yes instance, and if it's greater than B, then it satisfies the, uh, the no instance. That's it, right? Uh, are, are, are there any constraint on choosing uh, A and B? Uh, so right now, there A and B can be anything. Um, you, yeah, you tell the computer what A and B you're interested in, uh, but then you fix it, um, and then it has to try to solve it for that A and B. Okay. Thank you. But later we'll add more uh, constraints on what A and B are. For example, just to jump ahead, A and B can't be like infinitely close together because then you're asking, I mean, that's like too fine a distingu distinguishing problem, right? You have to have a little bit of gap to, to allow the computer some room to, to distinguish between the two. Okay. Yeah. Just so I, so I can wrap my head around what that means. Do you have like a concrete example of a, some decision problem if and for which what A and B would be? Okay, that's a great question. So, so here's an example. Let's, let's go back to the classical case. Uh, just, uh, at least for me, it's very helpful to ground my intuition and what, what this means. Um, so, so I claim that this max cut problem, um, you know, you walk up with this graph and then we had this Hamiltonian that I wrote before. So you have this Hamiltonian, which is the sum over ZU tensor uh, ZV. Um, so it turns out that the, the minimum energy 
of this uh, of this Hamiltonian, it's going to be um, the number of edges of your graph minus, uh, I think it's twice the size of the maximum cut. Okay. So the lecture notes from last week will uh, derives this, so you, so you can take a look. But just uh, take my word on this for now. Um, so uh, you know that abstractly, but of course you're, you're interested in finding out what the max cut is. Like someone hands you a graph, like what is the max cut? Uh, this can be phrased as an instance of this uh, k-local ham problem. So max cut is um, it's sort of a two-local Hamiltonian problem because these are these are two local terms, and what are the a and b? Well, the a could be. Let's say you're trying to determine whether. Um, basically, you set two thresholds. Like you want to know, is the cut bigger than two uh, c one, or is it uh, smaller than two c two? Uh, uh, c two. Okay, so C1 and C2 are, are different cut sizes, like how many edges uh, you can cut. So if you could distinguish between whether the minimum energy is below uh, this amount or above this amount, that equivalently tells you whether the max cut is, uh, sorry, I think I messed this up. This is C2 less than C1. The point is, suppose you, you took this Hamiltonian and you knew that its minimum energy was less than m minus 2c1. That tells you that the max cut must be at least as large as c1. On the other hand, if the minimum energy is greater than m minus 2c2, the max cut has to be smaller than c2. So this gives you a way of it's like a, a, another way of calculating the max cut uh, size, at least between two different cases. Okay, so like it's basically uh, trying to f or like fit these two values so that your solution uh, basically makes sense, right? So uh, you have this kind of a gap or a range where you know if if that is the case, if it is below that, uh, it's yes problem, but you don't care how or like what the actual range is, right? Right. Um, of course, you say, well, what if I want to know more information? Like, what if I want to know what the actual minimum energy is or what the actual max cut size is? Well, you can do, you can sort of sweep the A and B until you've homed in. You know, you can do like a binary search. Is it less than or bigger than this? Okay, yes. Then let me shift the A and B until you've homed in on the right value. Okay. So the reason we put this A and B is just to put it in, 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 the, in the language of a decision problem. Yeah. Good questions. Uh, any other uh, any other questions? Um, be good to make sure that we understand this. Yeah. What happens if it falls between the gap, like between A and B? There, then we sort of there's we don't care. Yeah. Then we sort of kind of give up, or we like we don't care what the answer is because it's sort of in this gray area. Um, the way we're formulating it, it's. We're, we're, we're sort of us implicitly assuming that the input satisfies the yes or no in instance. Uh, if it's somewhere in between, then we, we sort of just throw up our hands and say we don't necessarily know. And explicitly, A equals B is not treated here. Or can A equal B? Uh, it's A cannot equal B because then the like the yes and no instances should be disjoint. Okay. Um, so this decision problem, this K local Hamiltonian, it's it's going to be like the, it's sort of like the. Um, the most important like decision problem that we'll consider uh, in the same way that, um, for example, K sat or three sat is important to the theory of NP completeness, right? This is our 
analog, our quantum analog of uh, K set. All right. Um, so what is a, you know, I've defined a decision problem. We can then ask, what is its complexity, right? Like, uh, just like classical CSPs have NP completeness, like, is there an analog for quantum CSPs? And this brings us to uh, the notion of QMA and, and QMA completeness. Okay, so uh, now we start talking about complexity theory. Um, actually, before I go there, let's let's just start with uh, the quantum analog of of P, which is this thing called BQP. What does this stand for? This stands for bounded error quantum polynomial time. And um, remember that complexity classes, they're sets of decision problems. Um, and this is a set of decision problems that can be decided or solved by polynomial time quantum algorithms uh, with bounded error. So some decision problem is in BQP. If there's some polynomial time quantum algorithm Let's call it A, such that if your the instance that you you've walked up with is a yes instance of whatever decision problem you're, you're thinking about, then when you plug in x into your quantum algorithm, it's going to output one with probability at least two thirds. And the reason we're talking about probabilities is because well, quantum algorithms are inherently probabilistic, so they don't always work all the all the time. We just insist that they work most of the time. And here we're picking two thirds just as some, um, it's kind of an arbitrary threshold. Uh, if, if X is a no instance, then X equals one with probability uh, less than one thirds. Uh, you can pick any two separated constants like you know, 99 uh, for the yes case and 0 0.1, 0 0.01 for the, the no case. Um, and it just reflects how much confidence you have in the output of the algorithm. Um, by convention, we just like to choose two thirds and one thirds, uh, but really it's, it's arbitrary. Uh, so what do I mean by a quantum algorithm? Um, so there is something called a quantum Turing machine, but like its definition is incredibly unwieldy and like no one uses it. I mean, basically it was only defined in like the nineties when people started thinking about this, uh, but then people quickly switched over to talking about quantum circuits because it's, it's like much easier to think about. Uh, so, so by uh, quantum algorithm, um, what we really mean is that A is uh, not just one thing, but it's an infinite family of quantum circuits. Um, and it's indexed by this number n, n is going to represent the size of your input. So for every input size, whether you're, you're talking about an input size of say, you know, 100 bits or 200 bits or 2000 bits, there's a different circuit uh, to deal with that for, for each input size. So if you walk up with some instance x that has that's n bits long. Then a of x really means, you know, you have some quantum circuit uh, a sub n, and in some portion of the circuit you're going to plug in as input the input you care about. And then uh, in the other parts of the input, you're going to put in zeros. This is like your ancilla qubits. Um, they're like the, the scratch 
uh, this is like the workspace that your algorithm has to do its computations. It runs its computations and at the very end, uh, you're gonna have a single output qubit that you're going to measure to get the, determine whether the answer is uh, one or zero. And uh, this is the output of, of uh, A of X. Um, so that's what I mean by a quantum algorithm. We really mean this infinite family of, of circuits that uh, depend on the input size. There's a, this additional constraint that these quantum circuits all have to be related to each other. Like you can't have a totally wildly different algorithm for every possible input size. So we also insist that uh, this family is what's called uniformly generated. Um, uh, but you know, if, if you don't know what that means, don't don't worry so much about it. I mean, it basically means that there's uh, a separate algorithm that you know you tell it. I want the nth circuit of this family, and uh, this algorithm will will write it out for you. <clears throat> okay. So so is BQP BQP clear to everyone? Um, the bounded error just means that uh, you know these numbers are are. Um, relatively well separated from each other. Like, you know, the, the difference between the, your algorithm outputting one on a yes instance and outputting zero is, is uh, significant. And, and this is, you know, roughly what we call uh, significant. What's the implication of choosing these numbers? Would, would things be drastically different if we chose a different threshold to begin with? Uh, good. It's it's not um, uh, sensitive to what numbers you choose as long as they're separated by a constant. So you could choose 99% or 1% um, or, uh, you know, 51% or 49%. Um, the set of problems that you can solve in polynomial time don't change because you can always amplify. Like if you wanted to get more confident in the answer of your algorithm, you would just repeat the algorithm uh, as many times as needed. As long as it's not an exponential amount of time. Exactly. So just to, uh, now that you ask, um, the only requirement is that the, um, so this number is called the completeness. It's just a term. Um, and this is called the soundness. And the only requirement is that the completeness minus the soundness is at least one over some polynomial number in, in the size of your input. As long as this is the case, um, then you can always, if you wanted to boost up the, your confidence, you could always just repeat the algorithm of polynomial number of times. Okay, so that's BQP. That's the analog of um, classical polynomial time. Now let's move on to uh, NP and its analog QMA. Okay, so QMA stands for Quantum Merlin Arthur. Hey, Henry. Yeah. Sorry, just, just a quick question about the nature of the circuits. So what is the precise source of randomness? Is it just the randomness that's inherent in the input qubits? Or is it also allowed to use some external sources of randomness? Uh, the randomness comes from um, measurement. So sure, yeah. Uh, there's no, I mean, everything. The input here is deterministic. It's just the input in all zeros. But uh, the quantum algorithms can easily manufacture their own randomness. For example, preparing the plus state and then measuring in the standard basis, you're going to get uh, zero or one with, um, you know, probability half. For example. Sure. Right. Um, sure. Yeah. But you know, generally speaking, most quantum algorithms uh, we we work with, whether it's like you know Grover search or you know the uh, you know Shor's algorithm, they're all probabilistic. They only output the right answer with uh, uh, you know two thirds probability or something like that. Yeah, so Alex was asking, uh, what is bounded error come to play? Yeah, that's just two thirds versus one third. Basically, as long as uh, C minus S is at least uh, one over polynomial, uh, then that counts as bounded error. 
um, if it's one over exponential, then that doesn't count as bounded error. That's a, that's a more powerful class actually. So QMA, um, so this one should, you know, you might be able to already guess what the definition of this should look like, but let's write it out. So a decision problem is in QMA. If there exists um, a quantum polynomial time algorithm, again, which means a family of uh, circuits, and this algorithm will take in two inputs, uh, not just X, the instance, but also uh, an additional input called the proof. So if you have a yes instance, uh, there exists some quantum state, psi, such that if you plug in your input and also this quantum state, this accepts with, <clears throat> this uh, equals one with probability two thirds. And if X is a no instance, no matter what proof state you plug in, your algorithm is going to output zero, uh, or sorry, I'll put one with probability at most one thirds. Okay. And uh, this state is called a quantum proof. Okay. And, you know, this should ring a bell because this looks very much like the definition of NP, except the proof uh, doesn't have to be just some string. This is, it can be any quantum state. And, and just to draw out the diagram, like, you know, we have a, a, a quantum circuit. If X is n bits, then you plug in X here. And someone, uh, in this case, it's, you know, we like to think of it as, as Merlin, some all powerful, all knowing wizard, is going to hand uh, this verifier, uh, who we call Arthur, uh, some quantum state psi, and Arthur is going to uh, and also Arthur sets, you know, these ancilla qubits to zero and performs some polynomial time quantum computation to determine whether X is a yes instance or a no instance. Um, yeah, so, so where does this like terminology uh, Merlin Arthur come from? Well, it's based off of this like medieval folklore um, about King Arthur, you know, the Knights of the Round Table. Uh, and, you know, King Arthur has this advisor who's, who's Merlin, but Arthur doesn't necessarily always trust Merlin. So whatever advice Arthur gets from Merlin, he has to verify it. And, and that's where this, uh, you know, so Arthur is, uh, you know, he's limited in his abilities, but he has to just verify what Mer Merlin tells him. Um, Do we know who came up with these with his name? Oh, uh, yeah, I think um, the, there's this um, computer scientist slash mathematician Lassie Babai. He's at U Chicago. He he came up with these names back in the '80s. Um, this was before quantum computing was really uh, studied, and so in classical complexity theory, uh, you know, people were just having fun coming up with these complexity classes, and they defined a notion of Merlin Arthur. Um, uh, Merlin Arthur proof systems, right? So it's exactly the setup. Like someone wants to determine, solve a problem, they can't solve it on their own, so they want to get a proof, just like in the NP setting. Um, and, and so we just like to think of them as characters, like Merlin tries to convince you of X is a yes instance, he gives you a proof. Uh, Arthur is able to perform polynomial time computations. Ar Arthur is also able to do probabilistic uh, computations uh, to determine I don't know whether that's the case. And so when quantum computing came around, they sort of just adopted this, uh, this naming. Um, okay, so, you know, so first let's, uh, 
one perspective on this definition of this complexity class, I mean, it seems like, what, okay, well, it's kind of this abstract definition and uh, what's interesting about it. Uh, one thing that's interesting is it really um, uh, defines kind of this really interesting notion of a, a mathematical proof and kind of uh, generalizes it. So the traditional notion of a mathematical proof is that, well, someone says, here's a formal statement X, which may or may not be true. Um, maybe X is something like there's infinitely many primes or P is uh, not equal to NP, right? Um, and to convince you of that X is true, someone will give you a mathematical proof. They'll give you like some table of text, okay? Uh, and they hand it to you and you get this text and you sort of check line by line, okay, is it a valid deduction uh, using, you know, the standard mathematical axioms. And at the end of this uh, verification, you, you should walk away convinced of whether X is true or not. Right. Here we're saying, uh, why does the proof have to be some table of text, right? Uh, some classical string. Why not just have it be some arbitrary quantum state, which could be some weird entangled superposition between a bunch of particles. Um, and to verify this quantum proof, you just perform some measurement on it. Uh, may, or, or, you know, maybe you can do something like uh, run the quantum Fourier transform on these entangled particles and then do some measurement. And at the end, the measurement will tell you whether this is a valid proof or not. Right? So it, it's kind of a funny, funny thing. Um, and the fact that, you know, the, this proof is some quantum state uh, has, it makes it have, have a lot of different properties. Like, for example, you can't copy the proof and share it with your friends, unlike a classical proof. Um, you know, due to the no cloning theorem. Um, and also maybe like difficult to extract any information about this quantum proof, uh, other than the fact that this statement X, which you were trying to verify uh, is true or not, right? Like, cause if someone hands you this quantum state and you try to do some measurements on some part, uh, parts of it to try to extract some information, you know, the, the state as a whole could collapse and, and then you would lose information uh, about the, the state potentially. Um, so, you know, the point is, uh, QMA gives rise to a new kind of proof, a new notion of proof, rather, um, and actually this notion of proof expands the realm of uh, things that we can efficiently verify. So examples of uh, things that can be So as we'll see, the local Hamiltonian problem will be something that can be checked efficiently using the quantum proof. Right? And I'll get to that in a second. Um, there's but something that's not related to physics uh, would be something called the group non-membership problem. Okay. Um, what is this problem? So uh, we all know, you know, hopefully we remember what a, a, a group is, like in the sense of a mathematical object, right? So a group is some set of objects, uh, elements uh, that have like a, a binary operation that we can call multiplication. If these set of uh, elements are closed under multiplication, there's inverses, there's an identity element, right? So. Hopefully you remember this from uh, your algebra class. Um, so the question is, uh, suppose, you know, there, someone gives you a finite group in, in the sense that you like, you know how, if someone gives you two elements, you know how to multiply them together and you can take inverses. Um, and someone tells you a description of a subgroup. Right? And then now someone says, here's an element little h of this group G is little h uh, an element or not 
sorry, uh, of the subgroup H. And you have to determine whether that's the case. Okay. And um, this problem, like we don't know how to uh, efficiently, like if, if this little h is not an element of this subgroup, this seems like a hard thing to prove uh, by just uh, writing down a classical proof, right? Basically, how do you show that something is not in this subgroup? Well, you have to show that there's no possible way of, of, of reaching h uh, just by take, multiplying elements of this subgroup. Um, but it turns out by using a quantum proof, you can actually efficiently prove to someone that this is the case. Um, so let me be a, a little more precise because this is actually a really cool um, uh, demonstration of, of, uh, of quantum proofs. So, so let's say we assume that you have a uh, black box access to uh, G, this group, meaning that you have some box, you can plug in uh, two elements A and B and out comes the product AB, okay? You don't know how it's, it's uh, doing this multiplication, but it just spits out the, the product. Um, you can also ask this, box, uh, tell me an inverse of some element and I'll say, okay, here's the, the inverse of, of element A, for example. Uh, and, that's, and that's how you have access to the group. Um, and let's also assume that you have some a priori upper bound on the size of this finite group. So you know that S size at most two to the N. So this means that um, every group element can be represented using, um, say, uh, n bits. Okay. So you can write down the names of group elements. You can multiply them together efficiently using the access to this black box. Um, so you have this black box, and you also have a some set of elements of G that you know, and someone hands you this set of elements, they generate a subgroup. Right? So basically you take all these elements, you just consider all possible products of them and, and their inverses, right? So, you know, just diagrammatically, if this is group G, then uh, the, this G1 up to GK could generate some subgroup of H that's inside. So, and then also someone just hands you some element H uh, in, in this group. Randy asks, the group does not have to be abelian. Uh, that's right, it can be an arbitrary finite group. It doesn't have to be uh, commutative. Okay. So is, is H and G or not? Um, don't you mean is it H and H or no? Sorry, uh, I keep on writing that. Yeah, it, 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 it is H and in, in, in big H in the subgroup. Okay. Um, so if H is actually an H, then it is possible to prove to someone that this is the case. Why is that? Well, th this is a, a non-trivial fact in group theory, but uh, you know that H is, you know, some, you know, uh, you can take, in order to generate H, you can multiply, you know, G1 by G10, and then maybe G5 inverse and so on. But the point is whatever product of these generators you have, there's only a polynomial length sequence of products that you ever need to consider.
Okay. So you can just tell someone, here's the polynomial length sequence of generators. And then that person can use this black box of G to multiply them together and say, oh yeah, it actually outputs H. So that's no problem. Uh, do you know that you only need a polynomial sized sequence? Ah, um, so it's not obvious. I don't know the proof to this. Um, this uh, uh, comes from, um, yeah, it comes from some non-trivial fact in, uh, in the theory. Yeah, I think you might want to have the classification of finite simple groups, which is very non-trivial. <laughs> so, uh, non yeah, non-trivial um, fact. Yeah, and then Adrian says this might rely on some really uh, heavy machinery, but whatever. Uh, it's apparently a true fact. So you know, this this tells us that. Uh, proving to someone that group membership is is in NP, but here we're actually interested in group non-membership. Right, so it's like proving the non-existence of a sequence of products to reach this element. How do you prove non-existence? That's a really weird thing. And I'm going to, uh, in the last uh, like five minutes before the break, I'm going to describe uh, a quantum protocol to do this. Um, so I'm going to describe what Arthur, the verifier, does. So he, uh, he's going to get some state from Merlin, some psi, and we're going to view this psi as just some superposition over group elements uh, in G. And uh, what we're really hoping um, is that the psi is actually the superposition of group elements in this subgroup. Okay. Um, this is what Arthur's hoping, but we don't know that this is the case. Okay, because Merlin, again, he might be devious, he might be trying to trick us. Um, he's just sending us some quantum state. But whatever, uh, it's it's we're going to interpret it as a superposition uh, over group elements. So um, so Arthur performs um, two tests. So uh, one test is going to be called the membership test, and it's going to be this uh, quantum. Uh, circuit. So it's very simple. Uh, he prepares one qubit in the plus state. This is the equal superposition of zero and one. And he gets, he takes this state that he gets from Merlin and controlled on this plus state, he's going to apply a controlled multiplication by H. So I'm going to call it, um, uh, Okay, and I'll explain what that means in a minute. Then he's going to perform a Hadamard gate. Uh, and this is not the subgroup H, but the Hadamard gate. And then he's just going to measure this um, to determine the answer of this non-membership query. Okay. Um, and then the other one is he's going to check whether this psi is indeed this equal superposition, right? Um, 
So I'm just gonna, for now, I'm just gonna talk about this membership test for now. So here, we're, let's just assume that actually psi really is this uh, equal superposition over H. We don't know that this is the case, but let's just assume it for now. Okay. And let's see what happens in, in this, uh, this algorithm. So, you know, in step one, we have this plus state times this equal superposition. Right? We do a uh, controlled multiplication. So uh, actually, you know what? Let me write this out. So what's the, the plus state is zero and one over root two. So in the case that the, the control qubit is zero, we don't do anything. So we have one over root two, one over square root h. Okay, but uh, when the control qubit is in the one state, we multiply everything by h. Right, so, so we've gotten to this step right now. And finally, we're going to do a Hadamard gate on the, the first qubit. So let's call this state, um, well, you know, this is state psi as before. Let's call this state um, theta. So after the Hadamard gate, uh, I'll skip the computation, but what you get is um, one over root two, zero tensor, psi plus, uh, psi plus theta plus one tensor psi minus theta. I think actually I'm missing a factor of root two, so this is probably a half. Okay, and then, and the point is we measure uh, this qubit to determine whether uh, this this element h, little h, was in the subgroup or not. So here's the claim. We can break it into two cases. Suppose that h was really uh, an element of the subgroup. Can anyone tell me what, what this state theta looks like? Wouldn't that just be psi? Because if uh, you multiply elements of group by an element of that group, it just Identity gives you back to the subgroup. Exactly. So, so here, where, where was my diagram? Uh, so here, H, we're assuming that H is part of this big H. So if you multiply everything in, in big H by H, it just sort of shifts everything around, but you haven't moved outside of H, of capital H. So, so this is still, as Hugh said, an equal superposition over elements of H. So what happens is that the psi minus theta is going to be zero. And then you're going to measure ket zero with probability one. So the algorithm has correctly identified the no instance. Now suppose H was, was not a member of the subgroup, then uh, what can, you say about the relationship between psi and, and theta? So first question, are there any overlap between the elements of here and the products here? No. Not, they're completely disjoint, right? If you take a subgroup and multiply it with an element that's outside the subgroup, you're going to completely shift that group. So psi is orthogonal to theta, and then you're going to measure one with 
turns out with probability a half. Okay, it won't be 100% certain, but you at least get uh, one with probability a half. So you're out, at least in this case where we're assuming that psi was really um, this uniform superposition over h, your algorithm has some you know, noticeable bias in, in terms of determining what the right answer is. Um, okay, and uh, good. So, so we're almost done. The, the only th thing is, well, how do we, we have to check how, how do we actually have this uniform superposition? Um, and this again uses some uh, non-trivial results in, in group theory. Um, if someone hands you a, a state, an arbitrary state, you can test whether it's, it's uh, and you have the generators of, of this subgroup. You know, you have the generators of the subgroup. You can test if the state is the superposition over, over um, that subgroup by first you generate a random element of the subgroup, which is possible to do uh, in polynomial time. And then you just basically multiply the state uh, with that random element and you see if it leaves the state invariant. Okay. So I'll just, I'll just write that down and, and we'll take a break. Um, and the, the non-trivial part is, well, how do you actually generate a random element uh, of H? Uh, this, again, uses, yeah, this, this non-trivial uh, group theory, but it is possible. Okay, so uh, let's take a 10-minute, uh, or sorry, let's take a five-minute break. So let's come back at 5.15. Uh, then we'll, we'll go back to Hamiltonians. a question. Yeah. Um, just back to the def definitions of BQP and QMA. Um, mm -hmm. Are we allowing X to be quantum as well, or does X have to be classical? Here, X is classical. Okay. Um, Would it make a difference if we allowed X to be uh, quantum? Super great question. Uh, so it, people really haven't formulated uh, a theory around that. So far, people focused on classical inputs X because uh, they want to relate it to classical complexity theory, in which case the inputs are always classical. Um, but actually, this is something I'm interested in, which is like, uh, can you define a, a complexity theory with quantum inputs where you have decision problems uh, that are sets of uh, quantum inputs? So yeah, if you, you know, if, if people are interested in, in thinking about that, I'd be happy to talk about that. Could you just go over again why if um, H is in the subgroup that um, theta and psi are equal? Sure. Yeah, so where were we? Yeah. Um, so the question it's is just uh, the first claim, the first claim. Yeah. So uh, this is theta, right? Yeah. And the question is, well, what what do I mean by H G? Uh, well, I mean, so H and G are group elements of of this mother group G, and then we're going to multiply them together. So H this H G uh, is is going to be a label of a group element within the mother group. 
Uh, and then the way we multiply it is by using this black box. So we, we plug in H here and then we plug in G here and this will tell us HG. So, but we know that HG is going to be an element of H. Yes, okay, yeah, I got it. And yeah, and so it's also like a bijective map, like it, it's a, yeah. Um, yeah, I see. Yeah. Thank you. And when you say um, efficiently convince someone here, is that like polynomial uh, with respect to K being like the, or with respect to N or, or what is it? Oh, great question. Uh, with respect to N, yeah. So, so here there's, um, uh, we have some parameter N, which just gives us an upper bound on the group G. So I mean polynomial in N, because like that's, uh, we need N bits to write down each of these things and all of our computations are polynomial in little n. Thanks. Uh, I have one question. Do we, do we know for sure that this problem is not in NP? Um, like you no, not at all. It's still, uh, it still could be an NP. I mean, of course, okay. with anything in complexity theory, like lots of things could be in P. <laughs> right. Um, but uh, we don't know. I think the best upper bound we have on this is uh, I'm tempted to say it might even be in QMA. Oh, like this, wow, okay. Yeah. I think uh, Lassie Babai believes that it might be in classical MA. Hmm. Um, but uh, as far as I can tell, this might still be an open question. Um, Henry, mm -hmm. could you clarify something for me with the definition of QMA? Sure. Um, so when you say that um, if the instance is a member of the yes class of the decision problem mm -hmm. um, and A returns one with a certain probability, so is that probability reflecting the membership of the instance as a yes instance or could you interpret the probability as to do with whether the proof is actually a valid proof of that instance, or is that? I would say it's more like the latter. It's, I mean, X is, it's either in, it's either yes instance or it's not. Right. It's whether, it's how convinced this algorithm is. So, so the, you know, think of it this way, like, you know, just maybe this where the, the personification helps, like, you know, imagine you're the algorithm, mm -hmm. you get this, quantum state at psi, you do some computation, then you measure, and then it out outputs one. And then, and then you say, well, is it more likely that X is a yes instance or X is a no instance? And then because of these numbers, you should two thirds versus one third, you should say, well, I, you know, more convinced that it's a, a yes instance because it's more likely. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Yeah, I, I was looking at Aronson, and Aronson has some um, notes on group bound membership and says that it's an AM. It has an R for Merlin protocol. So, oh, if you know, um, oh, I see. Oh, also, Adrian, you sound like Darth Vader. <laughs> oh, is my mic not working? Uh, it, oh, it's very, very scratchy. Okay, well, I'll try to figure out what's going on. Sure. I see, but I, yeah, I guess Adrian said it's uh, it's an AM, which um, I guess that's incomparable to QMA. It's an interesting thing. Yeah. Uh, let's see, Randy asks, uh, I might be missing something, but the quantum proof does not depend on the little h. Yes, the quantum proof only depends on the subgroup of big H. Um, well, in, in this in this analysis, we're we're assuming that Merlin is 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 being nice and, and telling you the right thing. In the adversarial case, uh, Merlin can give you anything, um, but we have a, this extra test to check that he's, he's giving you the right kind of proof state. Um, yeah, and then Hugh says, yeah, the, what, what the verification algorithm does, it, it will do something that depends on little h. Great questions. Um, okay, so 
Yeah, maybe let's let's continue on. Um, so this group non-membership thing is kind of cool because it's like groups and and you know membership of elements and groups. This is something that comes from like abstract algebra, right? Uh, seemingly has nothing to do with quantum states or quantum physics. Yet, here's a cool example of where using quantum information can actually give you uh, uh, some advantage um, in in at least for this verification task. Um, okay, and, and just an, another comment about like, you know, you look at this, you're saying, well, where is the, the quantum advantage coming from? And it might be tempting to think that, well, you know, quantum states are, are really complicated, right? Like if you have n qubits, to describe n qubits, you need a two to the n size classical description. You need to keep track of exponentially many parameters to describe this quantum state. So maybe that's why, uh, at least in this group non-membership problem, uh, Merlin is able to convince you with a quantum proof because he's packing in, maybe he just takes a, an exponentially long classical proof and squeezes it into an n qubit quantum proof and, and somehow that's what's happening. Um, but that's actually, uh, I that would be kind of like the wrong intuition to take away um, because, you know, um, you know, even though an n qubit quantum state requires uh, exponentially many parameters, you cannot reliably store uh, an exponential amount of information in n qubits. Uh, because if you, if, you, if you try to do that and you send these n qubits to someone and they try to uncompress or recover that exponential amount of information, you know, they would make some measurement, but then the state would collapse and all that information would just disappear. Um, so quantum states are fragile in that way. Um, in fact, you know, forget exponential. If you have n qubits, <clears throat> there's something known as Halevo's theorem that says you cannot reliably transmit more than n classical bits of information using n qubits. Okay, so uh, this advantage in verification for the QMA setting is, is coming from something else. And, um, you know, what it is, I, you know, I don't have a much better answer, uh, but it's definitely not just squeezing in classical information in, in this naive way. So let's go back to local Hamiltonians. So let's go back to class uh, to quantum physics, and we want to show that um, this local Hamiltonians problem is uh, is in QMA. Okay, so we have this k local ham problem. We have these these parameters a and b, right? So suppose someone walks up to you with an instance of this. So they have a local Hamiltonian uh, and, they, and they're claiming the ground energy of this Hamiltonian is less than A. So how might someone convince you of this fact? Give you an eigenstate? Yeah, well, which in, in particular, which eigenstate? With the ground state? Yeah. So. So Merlin can say, well, look, here's the ground state. This thing uh, certifies that the energy is uh, uh, less than A, right? Um, and, and this is, again, where, uh, where quantum helps because if Merlin was only able to give you um, uh, a classical piece of information, it's, it's not clear how he could do that other than just writing down all two to the n amplitudes of that state, which would be too big. But giving it, handing it you in quantum form, you can actually do something efficient uh, to check. You, you want to check if uh, this this proof state H really has low energy with respect to uh, some local Hamiltonian. Um, So, so how do you do this? Well, let's, let's sort of just write out, expand out the, the definition of this energy. So this is equal to, well, we have a bunch of local terms, right? <clears throat> Each HI, this is where locality comes into play, 
HI only acts on k qubits. So think of k as being like two or three qubits, right? So you really just have to measure. So for each term i, measure the energy of psi with respect to uh, that local term. Um, so let's say that <clears throat> this little hi acts on some subset si of n qubits. And furthermore, um, let's, you know, since this little hi is Hermitian, we can diagonalize it. So let's diagonalize it. So it's going to be a, it's spectral decomposition looks like this. We have some eigenvalues, lambda ij. We have some projectors, pij, that are orthogonal. And these pijs form a projective measurement, right? Because they're orthogonal, they sum to the identity. And it's a projective measurement on k qubits. So again, just uh, continuing to expand, we get that this is equal to um, sum over i, sum over j. We have lambda i j. Psi p i j tensor identity. So, okay, and we can think of, um, you know, again, like this is sort of, you're kind of like, uh, you know, for each term i, you're doing a measurement on some small number of qubits k using this projective measurement. You get outcome j with this probability, and then you output an eigenvalue lambda ij. And so this is the quantity that we want to estimate efficiently on a quantum computer. So, you know, this suggests the, the following algorithm. Right, so uh, step one of the algorithm, let's assume for now that the input is some large number of copies of the supposed ground state. Let's call it some large number t okay. So step two, we're going to have some counter that just uh, keeps track of uh, our energy. And then we're going to do the following many, many times. So for t equals 1 up to big T, we're going to, um, we're going to pick a random term to measure. Right, so we have an m term Hamiltonian. We'll pick one of them at random. We're going to load a fresh copy you know, one that we haven't used yet, fresh copy of psi, right? We have many copies of psi, let's just take the one that we haven't used it, uh, used yet. And then we're going to measure the si qubits of psi using this projective measurement pij, right? Which uh, we, we, we defined up here. Right, it's like the projective measurement corresponding to the ith term. Okay. And if the outcome is j, then we're going to set some random variable x sub t equal to the, uh, this 
corresponding eigenvalue, and we're going to uh, just multiply it by m just for reasons that you'll see later. Okay. So for every little t, we're going to do this measurement, and we're going to get a, a sample of this random variable x sub t. So we do this like a gajillion times. And at the end, we're just going to take a, a large average. So out of all the random variables we've uh, collected, we're just going to take uh, this average. And that's going to be our estimate of the energy. If this E is less than A, then we accept. Otherwise, we reject. Any questions uh, so far about the description of this, this verification algorithm? I have a question. Um, mm -hmm. So all these uh, T, capital T copies of Psi, those are given by Merlin, right? We're assuming, yes. So how do we um, know that he's giving us uh, like identical copies? Um, and I, I think I want to relate this question to something I was wondering before, which is when defining BQP, we said that the thresholds two thirds and a third are arbitrary because we can just uh, repeat the algorithm many times. Mm -hmm. um, but that doesn't seem to be the case, or maybe, maybe I'm just not seeing it for QMA uh, because for QMA to repeat the algorithm many times, you would need many copies of psi. And there doesn't seem to be a way to both check that the copies are the same and use them. That's a, a fantastic question. Um, so uh, I guess comment number one is, uh, it's, you're absolutely right. It's not obvious that you can just repeat uh, with QMA to amplify the success probability in the same way that you would just do it for BQP. You can, but it requires uh, some arguments. Uh, and I, I might have a chance, I don't know, it might even be like a problem set question. Um, uh, comment number two is, um, you're saying, how do we know that Merlin is handing us T identical copies of the same state, right? Like, you know, we're thinking of Merlin as being someone who's trying to make our lives difficult. Um, so instead of handing us uh, T copies of state, he could just hand us some arbitrarily complicated entangled state across T registers. That's possible. Um, it'll turn out that uh, it doesn't help Merlin to do this. Um, but just for now, just to, to make things simple, let's assume that uh, we really do get fresh copies of, you know, ID copies of the same state. So, but that, that's a really good question. Um, uh, in fact, I'll make a note of it. Okay, um, so let's, uh, yeah, any, any other, so before I like analyze why this uh, could be a good verification algorithm, uh, any, any other questions about like the, the definition of, of this algorithm or, or what's going on? So like, if I, I let's say for every, but because you're randomly picking the terms from the Hamiltonian, right? Mm -hmm. Then, then that is basically estimating the eigenstate of that local term and not the full Hamiltonian. So there mm -hmm. might be a case when uh, the a term might not because you, anyways you are picking it, picking it at random, right? So uh, shouldn't there be a like a uh, I don't know like uh, assurance or something that you have picked all the terms because if you haven't, you cannot. Uh, it's it's not the 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 full eigenstate of the the Hamiltonian, right? Because you you might be missing a term or something. So how right. how do we uh, right. Um, so the way to take care of that problem is to ensure that T is large enough so that with very, very high probability, you've covered all your terms. Okay. So, so like, let's say, let's say T is like M squared, then, I mean, it's vanishingly small probability that you won't sample all the terms. Okay. So like, it's, it's more of a probabilistic uh, argument that, okay, we will at least have it once and then, mm -hmm. okay. 
Mm -hmm. Okay. And, and not just once, but you know, enough times to, to get your estimate correct. Uh, so, is, uh -huh. is J uh, chosen randomly as well? It's random because of the measurement. So, um, so this, um, this, this projective measurement, uh, this PIJ has outcomes indexed by J. So when, uh, so you do, but this whole set is indexed by I. So when you do the ith measurement, um, it outputs a, a J with some probability. Okay. Yeah. In fact, we'll, we'll see it with this analysis right now. So, so let's assume we're in the yes case. That means there really does exist a psi such that uh, this energy is less than A. So Merlin will say, okay, I'm gonna hand you a bunch of copies of this psi, right? Um, so let's just look at this random variable. What is its distribution? What is its average? Well, let's just focus on its average. So X of T, well, um, you know, the, the average is going to be, you picked a term uniformly at random between one and M. And then you measured psi according to this projective measurement uh, PIJ, right? So what does J run, uh, run up to? Well, uh, it's, you know, this little HI is dimension two to the K by two to the K. So that's how many J's uh, there are. Right, this is the probability of obtaining the Jth outcome, given that your term is the ith term. Once you get that outcome, your random variable is going to take on value uh, lambda ij times m, right? according to my definition. But you know this should look very familiar. The m's cancel, and I claim that we just get this energy of psi with respect to h. Right? which is the thing you wanted to estimate. So it's very good that this random variable has its, its expected value is the, the number we really want to estimate. And we're, we're drawing T samples of this IID of this same random variable. And we're taking an average. Right? So it should be very believable that um, as t goes large by like, you know, standard concentration arguments or law of large numbers, this is going to converge to the expected value, which is um, right. So uh, in, in fact, you know, with with very high probability, and you know, I won't say the exact bounds here. But you, you know, you can work them out. Um, we'll have the following guarantee that this average will be, you know, within plus or minus epsilon of the true number you wanted to estimate. Okay, and by taking T is to be some sufficiently large number that's polynomial in the number of terms you have, the number of qubits, uh, we can guarantee that this epsilon, this like uh, precision, is going to be much less than the difference between B and A, right? Which is the gap you're trying to distinguish. So, you know, once you've guaranteed this point, then your estimate will tell you whether you're less than A or, or below, uh, less than A or above B with, with high probability. Okay, uh, so, so that's, you know, so hopefully that should make a lot of intuitive sense. I mean, you're, you're just making these local measurements randomly, but you're doing enough of them to estimate the, the global energy um, uh, with, with high confidence and high precision.
Any questions about this uh, so far? So would the runtime also be polynomial in like one over B minus A? Yes, that's right. Uh, so, uh, I mean, th that basically comes into what T is. So T actually also depends on um, B minus A. So, uh, Actually, I think I forgot. Sorry, I think I forgot to say something about this um, local Hamiltonians problem that's uh, kind of important for this, and it's also related to your homework problem. Um, we also need to assume that each of this is, and this is just for like normalization purposes. The operator norm of each of these terms individually is at most one. The the largest eigenvalue of uh, of each of these terms is at most one. So this is just to ensure that like your scale for which your energies uh, live at uh, aren't like, you know, off the charts. Um, or, you know, to put it another way, it means that these lambdas uh, are um, between minus one and one. So, you know, you have some reasonable bound on, on what these lambdas are. Okay, so that's the yes case. So if there really is a low energy eigenstate, um, Merlin can convince you of this fact. What about the no case? Um, and, and if Merlin actually gave you, uh, you know, T copies of some state psi, it doesn't matter what state, because we know that all states have energy at least B. then you know your algorithm will still work because it's going to estimate the energy correctly. Okay. Um, well, what if Merlin doesn't give you, um, yeah, what if Merlin doesn't give you uh, T copies of psi, but it gives, it mixes and matches, like for different coordinates, it gives you, uh, you know, you know, psi one and psi two, tensor psi three. Uh, anyone have an idea what happens then? Well, then you'll just in expectation get the average of their uh, energies, their, uh, I, I, yeah, like their energies, um, which if they're not all the ground state, then it'll be uh, at least as, or at least as big as the ground state energy. Mm -hmm. um, so if you put the ground state is higher than B and you take the average of a bunch of, or in expectation, you get the average of a bunch of things that are higher than your ground state, then an expectation will get something higher than B. Exactly. So it, you know, Merlin can't convince you otherwise because, you know, each of these random variables, they, they might have a different distribution because you're using a different psi each time, but the average is always going to be above B. So, so this is still fine. Arthur will be like, okay, it's not less than A. Um, the more nefarious thing is if, you know, Merlin sends a giant entangled state that's not necessarily like, uh, a, you know, a bunch of tensor copies of, of, of states. And the, the claim is that this still doesn't help Merlin. Like it actually, your algorithm will still realize that the, the ground energy is, is uh, at least B. But this, you know, this requires sort of a, a little more intricate analysis, but it, but it is true. Like th this entanglement doesn't help Merlin.
Okay. So uh, this shows, you know, basically what you've just seen, modulo this, this last part, is that this K-local Hamiltonian's problem, AB is in QMA. As long as uh, B minus A is not too small. So B minus A has to be separated by at least some polynomial gap. Okay, so, so far so good. Um, we followed this classical quantum dictionary pretty well. Local Hamiltonians are quantum analogs of CSPs. Uh, we've shown that local Hamiltonians are in QMA, which is the analog of NP. And, and now let's talk about QMA completeness. So what that tells us is these, this local Hamiltonians problem characterizes the complexity of QMA. Okay, and this brings us to the quantum analog of the cook levin theorem. Okay, um, so fix your favorite decision problem in QMA. We're going to show there exists an efficient transformation um, of instances x for this decision problem into local Hamiltonians h uh, that are instances of, uh, uh, well, you know, um, such that if X was originally S instance, then the ground energy of, of H is going to be small. And if X is a no instance, then the ground energy is going to be high as where low and high are characterized by A and B. So how do we do this? Well, we're, we're going to try to follow the, the intuition of the classical cook levin theorem. So the fact that we have a QMA language here, well, let's just unpack what it is. Well, we have this um, family of verifier circuits, right? Um, one for each input length. And so let's just fix an end for, for now. Okay. So we have this verifier circuit, this uh, A sub N, and we plug in this X. Merlin will hand us a proof. We have some ancilla qubits. We do some polynomial length computation, and then we can decide uh, yes or no instance with high probability. Uh, and furthermore, let's, let's just uh, imagine, you know, uh, what the gates inside the circuit might look like. They can, this circuit consists of one and two qubit gates that are arranged in, in different ways. And let's call the gates uh, U1, U2, U3, and so, so forth, all right, up to the very last gate. So the UIs are uh, one and two qubit gates. You know, they're unitaries. Um, okay, so remember that the cook levin theorem, um, what was it doing? It was saying, you know, you had some classical computation, this Turing machine, and you're going to like have a snapshot for every step of the Turing machine. You're going to write each snapshot as a bunch of variables, and you're going to have constraints on these variables to make sure that the snapshots really are valid, like they transition to each other in a valid way. Um, 
also the snap, you know, the beginning snapshot starts okay, the ending snapshot ends okay, uh, and you sort of put all that together and you have a bunch of constraints that the only way to satisfy them is if the snapshots correspond to your verifier accepting on some proof. We're gonna mimic that uh, by creating this uh, quantum constraint satisfaction problem. So this is, we're gonna transform this into the Feynman Kataev Hamiltonian, which is named after Richard Feynman and, and Alexei Kataev, who, who kind of developed this idea. Uh, I'm gonna call it uh, H, and it, it's a bunch of terms. Um, this H has ground states that look like this. So I'm gonna call it omega. And let's say that our circuit runs for time t. It's going to be an equal superposition over all t plus one time steps of this circuit. We're going to have a register that keeps track of what time step we're interested in. And we're going to have a snapshot of that intermediate state of the computation. So this is what I call the clock. Okay, it keeps track of what time it is. And this is going to be the T snapshot of the computation of A sub n, right? And more specifically, for every intermediate time t, this is going to be equal to some, you know, all the gates ut, u minus, ut minus one, u one, applied to the input of this circuit, which is going to be x, the supposed proof state, and zero. So we're gonna design a local Hamiltonian that has this as its ground state. And, and there's many, many choices of, uh, the, potentially many choices of ground states because there could be many choices of quantum proofs that make the, that maximize the acceptance probability. But whatever those states are, um, the ground states must have this form. And uh, these in particular are called history states. Uh, because they tell the history of the computation of this verifier. Okay. Um, and, and just to be clear, like, you know, suppose that the number of uh, qubits that this circuit acts on is, um, I don't know, let's give it a, a number like R qubits. then the history states are on um, log t plus r qubits total. Uh, why is that? Well, the snapshot part of it, this is uh, r qubits because, you know, the omega uh, sub t will be like, if you just like pause the computation at the t time step, that will be the quantum state of these r qubits. And then this log t here will be the number of qubits needed to represent the, what time it is. Since time runs through one through t, you need at least log t qubits. So this is for the, the clock and this is for the snapshot. Okay. So hopefully you can start to see some resemblance between like this history state and this Cook-Levin tableau that we talked about last time.
right? The Tableau had all these snapshots laid out on rows and you, know, you got it all at once. Here, the snapshots are laid in superposition. Uh, okay, so that's the, the ground state we're, we're aiming for. How do we design a Hamiltonian to obtain this as the ground state? Well, we're going to create terms that correspond to the starts okay check, evolves okay, and ends okay. Right, the starts okay is to make sure, so we're gonna have Hamiltonian terms to check. We're going to check that this omega zero, the very first snapshot, which is the beginning of your verifier circuit, has this form. And you want to make sure that the, the verifier algorithm starts with the right input, right? The evolves okay is to make sure that for each psi t, it's equal to the tth gate applied to the previous snapshot. And then the final check is to make sure that if you look at the very last snapshot, measuring the output qubit of omega capital T yields one with high probability. So if you walked up to me with some quantum state, uh, to some history state that satisfies starts okay, evolves okay, ends okay, then what does this tell you? Any ideas? What was the question again, sir? I was writing. Oh, sure. So if someone has a history state and you, and you know that it satisfies each of these constraints, like starts okay, evolves okay, ends okay, uh, what, what conclusion can you draw? Right, this, this history state should be telling you a story, right? Like uh, it should be proving to you some, some fact about this original circuit. It's almost um, tautological. Is it just uh, that there exists a circuit that solves the problem? So the circuit is fixed. Um, is it just saying that the that circuit above does a valid computation, which uh, accepts with high probability. Um, so yeah. like that, that problem in QMA uh, or that algorithm is, is valid. Yeah. So, so we're fixing the circuit here and someone hands us a history state that tells us this circuit has, has valid snapshots of this particular circuit at each step. And at the end, uh, it outputs one with high probability, then you don't need to run the circuit yourself. The, the history state tells you that this is true. So, So it tells you that there is some psi that's part of this history state where if you ran this circuit A on X psi and zero, outputs one with high probability, right? 
But what do we know about this uh, verifier circuit? It tells us that that must mean X is a yes instance of your original language. Okay. So uh, that's what this Hamiltonian is supposed to do. Um, and uh, I'll finish this up next time, but we're going to have a, a bunch of terms that corresponds to, you know, starts okay, evolves okay, and ends okay. And actually each of these will, will decompose into smaller terms. But it will be a local Hamiltonian. Uh, and it, it really enforces all of these constraints. So, and it'll turn out that uh, whatever the acceptance probability is, like, um, yeah, so uh, let's see. Um, well, uh, okay. So the basic the, the punchline is that the, the ground energy of H will reflect whether X is uh, a yes instance or a no instance. And that, that completes this reduction. And it shows us that we can encode arbitrary QMA problems as instances of the local Hamiltonians problem. So uh, that's it for today. Um, I'm happy to stay on for a few more minutes and answer any questions that people might have. Um, next time, uh, I'll describe what this Hamiltonian looks like. Uh, we won't uh, analyze every gory detail of it. Um, we'll just talk about it at a high level. Uh, and then uh, I'll jump into uh, this thing called the quantum PCP conjecture, um, which continues this theme of changing the notion of what we mean by mathematical proof. Okay, so uh, thanks. <laughs>
So in general, no, because even, even if you allow yourself only two, two qubit gates, right? Um, but the thing is, these gates can introduce entanglement. So uh, representing, even after a, a small number of these two qubit gates, you can generate entanglement that's so complicated that to write down the, the full vector of all n, uh, n qubits in your computation uh, would require, uh, you need to keep track of like two to the n parameters. Uh, what? Because it, it, might, it might be that the explicit terms is two to the power n, but can, is it possible that we have uh, something, uh, some measurement that is efficient such that we can still efficiently sample from this measurement, from this state? Because we really, we really have a compact description for this state given this, uh, this, this circuit. Right, oh, good question. Um, so the whole belief is that it's not possible to, even in though you're right, like if you have like say a polynomial size circuit, you can, rep, you can describe the circuit efficiently, but then to sample from say the output distribution of the circuit, uh, we believe is, is actually intractable. Uh, we don't have a proof of this, um, but this is sort of the, uh, at least the best complexity theory evidence is, is that you cannot. Um, and, um, you know, I mean, there's, there's some like complexity theory proof in the sense that if you could sample from this distribution exactly, then you could solve uh, things that are provably hard, like, you know, for example, computing the permanent of, of some matrix. Um, uh, you know, so, so we know that's, um, uh, you know, so, and, you know, the assumption is that that's difficult for, uh, um, for classical computers. Uh, I see, yeah. thanks. Yeah. yeah. In the, in the no case of the local Hamiltonians, um, you were saying how if um, Merlin were to give us a, an entangled state, we would still reject the, um, we would still reject our, uh, our ground state energy, we would still reject because it'd still be greater than B. That's mm -hmm. not, could you just go through that again? Because it wasn't really obvious to me. Oh, it's not obvious at all. Um, so I, I didn't uh, explain the proof. It requires a proof. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I'm, I may include this as a problem set, but, um, but uh, the intuition is that, I mean, if you sort of look, analyze um, what Arthur is doing in this algorithm, he's, He's treating each of these uh, registers independently, like each of these. I mean, you divide them into bl blocks of n qubits, right? Because we were thinking, you know, in our heads, we're thinking each block is independent of each other. Yeah. And so we're just going to measure one and and get an estimate, uh, and then after we measure this, the first block of n qubits, this is going to, in general, collapse the rest of the state in some other way because the whole state is entangled. Yeah. But no matter how we collapse it, the next n qubits, when you just consider them by themselves, cannot, uh, the average measure, you know, the average energy of the next n will still be greater than b. Because there's no state that has energy less than b. Yeah. And so yeah. then you perform the measurement and then they'll collapse the, you know, the, the remaining and so on. You, you sort of can do this iterative like uh, measurement thing and you sort of argue that at all at all times, you know your estimates for these the average of these um, these random variables x uh, are always going to be at least b. Thank you. But it requires an argument, yeah. So it, it's it's not obvious. So the a quantum state or the entanglement looks pretty similar to a probabilistic drawn dis distribution. So why do we really care about quantum computing instead of this, uh, instead of like uh, 
probably is theory. Is it because of it's more realistic? Uh, good question. Yeah, it, it seems like it's similar to yeah, general probability. Um, but the difference is uh, in quantum, uh, you can uh, have cancellation. Like you can essentially have what, think of them as having negative probabilities, which can cancel, you know, when you, when you sum up, like in normal probability theory, when you sum things up, you can only add things. Like things never become less when you sum up probabilities. But with uh, quantum information, uh, you have these amplitudes, which can be in, in general complex. So when you sum up a bunch of complex numbers together, uh, these amplitudes, they can interfere and sometimes uh, create a bigger number or create a smaller number. Uh, and that's gives a, you know, leads to a big difference between classical probability theory and, and quantum information. I see, that makes sense, thanks. Yeah. Um, maybe the, the, this was asked, but why is the locality of each of the terms uh, O of log T? In this Feynman Katai of Hamiltonian? Yes, at the end of the proof. Yeah, yeah um, it's not necessary. Um, I mean, I, I didn't describe this actually uh, because I didn't say what the terms were. Um, it comes from uh, I mean, the way I'm representing the timestamp here, the clock, I'm representing the clock in binary. Okay. So each, each of the clauses, you will look at the clock and, and do something based on what the clock is. Uh, there's, a, there's a way that you can reduce the locality to a constant, say oh. two or three, just by encoding the clock in a better way. Basically, you, you encode the clock in, in unary. You just have like, you know, uh, okay. N ones to represent timestamp uh, N. And there, the locality will actually go down to like three or four, depending on your encoding. Okay, thanks. So that means that even if I restrict K to be like three or four, the problem is still QMA complete. Yes. Uh, in fact, we know that uh, two local Hamiltonians is uh, QMA complete. Oh. But there you need really uh, exotic um, clock encodings. So um, I don't know, for the rema remaining people here, like uh, I think, yeah, this will be helpful for me. Are, are there any comments about um, sort of like the material so far? Like, am I going too fast, too slow? Uh, should we take more breaks? Uh, uh, any feedback on, on that account? I think it was going at a decent pace. Uh, I don't know, like I, I look back at the notes occasionally, but I don't know, I feel like I'm following. Okay, good. Also very interesting stuff. Yeah, it's, it's a cool mix of things. Yeah, it looks interesting, but I really, I don't have a sense that I have an intuition of, um, like I'm catching glimpses of what you're saying. So I'm wondering if there is, I mean, I guess I can go through the uh, lecture notes again, but is there like a text that can give a bit more of a, introductory sort of material to this. Um, I presume most of the students in this course have a, some sort of quantum or mathematical uh, background. Um, uh, for those of us who are from engineering uh, who are encountering this for the first time, you know, like, so do you have some recommendations for that? Uh, yeah, I can provide recommendations. Um, you know, unfortunately, there are no, you know, this stuff is pretty new, so there's not a lot of any definitive textbook. I can send you different lecture notes on that people have, have covered. Um, so what, what's your background? Uh, so electrical engineering um, on the performance engineering and cloud technologies sort of side of things. Mm -hmm. 
So and uh, uh, so in terms of like math, probably I know you know like probability, uh, discrete math, um, linear algebra, advanced calculus, um, roughly the things there. I'm, I'm falling back sure. on. <laughs> sure, sure. I, yeah, I guess um, the way I'm going about it is it's really coming at from the perspective of it, it's like more theory, like it's a theory theoretical perspective on on this. Um, you know this. Yeah. So as you could probably tell, um, yep. basically it's, you know, we're, we're taking like the ideas that come from complexity theory and saying, how can we use these ideas and, and try to understand quantum many body systems in, in a qualitative way, like in a conceptual way. Um, okay, that's good. So I guess yeah. if one could familiarize oneself with uh, complexity theory in general, that would be a, you know, kind of a nice way to get a context of it. Yeah, I think um, yeah. that's coming where I, I'm coming at it from. Yeah, okay, great. Thanks. <laughs> oh, sure, yeah, the group theory I went through um, a little fast, uh, um, but, uh, a bit, you know, Hopefully you got the gist of it. It like wasn't the most important thing. It, it was just something that I thought would be cool to kind of uh, give a, a, a non-physics illustration of quantum proofs. Um, but yeah, we'll have the, there'll be the recordings and lecture notes. Uh, yeah, it's good. You know, it's look good. So I, I'm sure <laughs> when I have a second look, it'll be easy to keep track of. So it's interesting for sure. Cool. Um, I would second uh, Hugh's uh, opinion. Opinion. Um, it's 